So good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to our global Nimble community. My name is John Farrar. I'm the CEO of Nimble. And I don't think I've been more excited to have a webinar uh, than I am today to be with my friend, Joel Calm. Joel, can you say hello to the audience? I'll bet you say that to all the Joel Calms that come on I your do. show. I hello, do. audience. Thanks for joining us. The, the thing I love about you, Joel, is that you're a teacher and a preacher like me, that I think that you love to grow others. And you've been doing it uh, probably since you were born, because it's just who you are. But you were an early adopter to social media, and you've ridden that wave and, and written tons of books, and you continue to teach. And as new things evolve, like Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency and others, you continue to learn and grow and teach others. So uh, how do you do that? Why do you do it? Well, first of all, I'm a nerd. You know, I've always been a nerd. If you go back to watch the John Hughes films, you know, The Breakfast Club, I was the Michael Anthony Hall character, right? You know, if you, if you watch Ferris Bueller, I was not Ferris Bueller. You know, in fact, a yeah. little bit of trivia, um, John Hughes grew up in, in my hood. And so those schools and those films are based on, and some were filmed at my high school in Northbrook, Illinois. Uh, oh, cool. So yeah, pretty interesting stuff. But I've always been a, a geek and I've always been into computers. I've always, uh, technology has just always appealed to me and, and not from a programming side, from a user side. And I sure. bought my first computer in 1980. Uh, wow. It was a, <laughs> a TRS-80 Model 1 with 4K of RAM and a, a tape player for a storage device. Yeah. You, you know, you know, Joel, you and I share so much in common besides the, our love of music. Mm. Um, I bought my first computer in 1978. It was Apple IIe, cost me $3,600, had 4K of RAM. I maybe it had, yeah, I had 4K of RAM, I bought a 16K RAM card to add on to it, had a cassette drive for storage and, and a nine inch green display. And I did that because I was a nerd like you. I used to spend my afternoons in the library a block away from my house because I just love consuming knowledge. And when my brothers bought motorcycles, I bought a telescope. And <laughs> so uh, believe it or not, uh, you and I are, are nerd bookworms who have evolved into uh, teachers and preachers, which is why I asked you here today is you got this new book uh, that is all about uh, helping others find their fun formula to success in life. Mm -hmm. And I think it documents how curiosity and risk taking can help you to uh, achieve your goals in life. And today we're going to talk about not only about that book, but how do you apply that to, uh, uh, to life and to sales and marketing? So um, with that, I'd love to uh, pass you the, uh, the agenda and let you go ahead and um, and uh, and take us away. Yeah, you know, this book was really written out of necessity uh, because as I've looked at the the landscape of business right now, there is this mentality that has unfortunately become pervasive that in order to succeed, one must hustle and grind. I just I bristle when I hear somebody teaching that that's what you need to do and, and and by that what they usually mean is if you want to succeed if you want it bad enough then you need to be up early you need to be the first one to the office you need to be working late and you know what while your uh, associates are off playing on the weekend on their boat or going to concerts or you know having drinks you need to if you're not really going for it unless you're in the office and it is simply uh, a death sentence. It is not sustainable. There is a very rare person that that actually works for. And those people, for them, it is fun. That's, you know, but what ends up happening is it gets in the way of quality of life. It gets in the way of relationships. And so I have reverse engineered my successes over 23 years of doing business business online. And I've looked at my failures. And what's really interesting is I found a common theme, John. I discovered that my greatest successes happened with the least amount of effort. And not just once, you know, once uh, could be a fluke, twice coincidence, but we're talking three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight home runs, major occurrences in my business. And then I looked at the failures and I realized in those failures, I actually spent more time with my nose to the grindstone, 
just working away and and doing the so-called hustle and grind. Uh, and that's where I was the least happy and fulfilled. And it's where I had the, the greatest failures. Now, don't get me wrong. Failures are great. They teach us a lot. In fact, I feel like failures teach us more than our successes um, because it shows us how we need to change and make adjustments in order to get what we want. But what I've discovered is the fun formula is not a mathematical formula and it's gonna vary from person to person, but really it's made up of three things. Curiosity, we have to be willing to explore and try new things. And I know you are that. We need to be willing to take risks. Uh, you know, which means we have to be willing to fail. You are that. And the third part of the the fun formula is serendipity or what I like to call trusting the process. It's understanding that it's the little things we do that can move mountains, the right phone call at the right time, uh, going to an event without expectations and being open to opportunity coming your way. It's, it's serendipity. And and I find that life has a way of unfolding before us when we are able to scan the horizon and watch for opportunity because it often shows up in ways that we don't expect. You, you know, Joel, you're you're really singing from my hymn book there in that mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe that the universe delivers for you if you're willing to give it your prayers and be present and aware enough to hear the, the the door the knocking on the door and to open the door and go through it and all of those elements require you to be present and aware and if you're on the grindstone in the trench distracted by your toils you won't be able to hear the universe when it's knocking mm. and and so i think that if you begin to unbundle some of the things that you and i just said it's it's really the, your book, the the fun formula. And and by the way, how, how did that the how did the idea come about? Well, again, this this is my fifteenth book, and all of the books I've written to date, for the the most part, have been strategic or tactical. You know, Twitter power. How to use Twitter for your business. The AdSense code. How to make money with Google. How to do internet marketing. Right. These types of things. Social media. This is the first book that really is more of a, a core message book for me because I am so frustrated with this hustling grind that's being taught. You know, we can all agree that hard work is a virtue, right? Yes. That, you know, hard work, you know, there's, especially there's times that you really got to buckle down and get it done. Um, but just because hard work is a virtue, somewhere along the way, somebody said, well, if hard work is a virtue, then 10x the hard work is 10x the virtue. That's simply not the case. That could amount to nothing more than just being busy. And so my frustration with seeing especially younger people and entrepreneurs being taught that this is the way to success, being uh, shown that materialism is somehow going to bring them fulfillment in their business and in their life. And it's just, it's simply not true. You know, nobody gets to the end of their life and says, I wish I made a few more dollars or I wish I worked a few more hours. The, the most important components in our life come from the people in our lives, the relationships that we have and the experiences that we get to enjoy with those people or individually. That's ultimately you know, what the, the sum of our life and the impact that we have on other people. Because, you know, we're, we all fall under the illusion that we're in the business of selling a product or a service. But this is going to come as a shocker. None of us are actually in the business of selling a product or a service. We're in the business of serving other people. And yeah. the product or service that we offer, that's just, that's the conduit. That's the channel in which we bring that service and bring that value. But if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? Even widgets have a place in making people's lives better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, a few of the things you said resonated with me there. One of which is the whole idea of hustle, right? When I think of hustle, I think of hustlers and nobody mm. wants to be hustled. Right. Uh, I, I think that we're all tired of slick will and I think that we we want to be we want to grow. And I think 
we want to be helped and served. I think service is the new sales. And I think that we're on this planet to grow our souls by helping other people grow theirs. And, and the sum of your life is the moments you've been truly present with others and the vibrations that you leave them with and that you take away. That's it. And so what you just said was we're on this planet to grow by helping other people grow. And you do that by being present with others, by listening and learning and finding ways to add value. And that the products and services that you represent is nothing more than just dust in the effing wind. You know, mm. Think about all the messages we get from the time we're little. Could be from parents, could be mm -hmm. from teachers, could be from peers, could be from society in general, mm -hmm. that we are supposed to be something. Right? What are you going to be when you grow up? How often did we hear that question? What do you, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to, my answer was always, I, I'm going to be me. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it is I, I end up doing. And mm -hmm. I've always had this curiosity of trying new things and playing with the, the different toys. I kind of envision myself as this, this uh, eternal 12 year old walking amongst uh, along the world with a pail and a shovel looking for sandboxes to play in. Right. And, yeah. and that's that curiosity and risk taking part to say, Oh, this looks interesting. Let's play with this. Oh, well, that, you know, that sand's not wet enough. So let's go, you know, let's go over there. Let's try that. Oh, look what I built. Oh, that was fun. I'm bored with it now. Oh, let's go over here and build that with this person. Oh, we just built this castle. We should build another one, you know, to match it. Right. It's this mentality of saying, I don't have to be one thing unless that one thing is me. And this is why over my career, I've done so many different things, built sites, sold sites, blogging, podcasting, video, live video, um, you know, public speaking, 15 books, internet marketing, affiliate marketing, social media marketing, software development, app development, because I can't sit still and go, well, this is all I'm going to do. Now, yeah. There are people that are singularly focused. Uh, you know, you, your nimble is your thing. But I'll bet you within what you do at nimble, there's a lot of variety and it keeps you interested. Yeah. Well, if you think about what drove you to build the fun formula, it was you heard, I think, well, I'll tell you what, what it build, drove me to build Goldmine and Nimble. And, and tell me if it's not dissimilar for you. I hear notes in my head, Joel. I'm like a musician where I hear da, 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 da. And I think, hmm, that's interesting. And the notes I, I, I heard, heard last night, by the way, it was the encore for Jeff Lynn's ELO because they played roll over Beethoven. So he uh, came up for the encore and that was, those were the notes. Exactly. And, and so I was sitting there in Dallas managing this reseller named Mark Cuban, who is a Novell reseller for my product Banyan back in the day, trying to manage these network of resellers and customers. And I was struggling with managing relationships. And there was no Outlook. There was no Salesforce. There was no CRM. There was no product that integrated email, contact and calendar mm -hmm. and sales and market automation. So I quit my job. And I jumped out of the airplane of making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as an enterprise sales rep to basically a startup guy in an apartment in Canoga Park because I never wanted to say shoulda, coulda, woulda, and that I believed I could always go get a job, but I can't always follow my dream. And so I followed my dream of building a product that solved a need that I heard in my head, but it turned out that it was a problem that millions of people suffer from and it turned into a gold mine. And what I love about what I did any, and I do today is I help other people achieve their dreams and their goals. And I think that's what you're doing right now with the fun formula. And I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think you built this book because you felt and heard these notes because you trust life. You jump from rock to rock in the river, not thinking about whether there's gonna be a rock you know, 10 feet ahead, you're just going and dancing through life and, and believing that life will deliver and life delivers for you. And you want to teach others about that dance. Is that right? Well, it, it, that is exactly right. You, you nailed it, John. And I think people are afraid. They're, they're, they, they want their security. They're afraid to try things because, well, they've never done that before. Or because people have told them, you know, well, you can't do that or you're not good enough to do that. They're afraid of losing that security. But, you know, in the movie Dead Poets 
society and it's classic the the late great robin williams his character stood up on the desk and told his students carpe diem seize the day we don't know how long we have john i mean eventually you and i and all of us will go the way of all men right and and dust we'll in the wind baby dust in the wind that's what we are and so you know and and we've all lost people that are dear to us who are younger than us and it was unexpected mm -hmm. you don't know when and so but there's this mentality of well one day you know at the end of my career i will retire and then i will fill in the blank you might not get that chance and what have yeah. you done in the meantime yeah. you have sacrificed the one life that you have and yeah. missed out on perhaps what would really bring you fulfillment and that's why i wrote this it's time to get away from everything being about materialism everything being about working your life away and finding success in your business and real fulfillment in your life you know, uh, Joel, that reminds me of the point that I was at in Goldmine, where we were in the business for about eight or nine years and doing nearly $100 million in revenue, had about 5 million customers worldwide. And it was on the way to becoming Salesforce, if you will. Mm. And, uh, and I sold it uh, on year 10 uh, when I was 40 years old and I retired because I spent 10 years of my life in the hustle and grind. I was hustling and grinding, and that was my life. I spent an hour or two hours each day driving back and forth between the office because I couldn't afford to live in Los Angeles. I lived in Thousand Oaks. And, and my day was filled with building that, that company. And I loved it because I was powering other people's passion, plan, and purpose in life by building the platform. But I knew there had to be more, and I didn't have time for my family and I had uh, a young baby with another on the way. I didn't have time for my friends. I didn't have time for my community. And I could have toiled in that business for the rest of my life and had built Salesforce, which would have been you know, 10 times as big as Goldmine. But what would that have delivered me? But what happened was a year after I sold the company, I got a head tumor and almost died. Mm -hmm. And in the process of healing, I went through a process of sort of rediscovering my soul. And that's why I came to my philosophy of life that we're on this planet to grow our souls by helping other people grow theirs. And you do that by being present with other people. And the most important people to be present with are the people who love you, your family and your friends. And if you're present with those people, they'll reflect your shit back at you. And if you're willing to look at your shit in life and work on it, you can grow as a human being. And that's why we're on this planet. Be present, listen, learn, grow, and help other people grow. And, and I think that's why the hustle and grind lifestyle is not sustainable. What do you think? I say preach it, brother. I'm, I'm over here waving my hands in the air going, hey, man. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's so true. But, and it's, you know, it's amazing that often we don't learn this until we get older and we make our mistakes and we realize, you know, that wasn't very satisfying because when we're younger, we're, you know, we want to go get it, take on the world, and I'm going to build my empire. And, you know, yeah. life has a funny way of throwing obstacles at you without even trying right we make these plans the, the old proverb is uh, man plans god laughs i don't think he's laughing i think he's yeah. smacking his head going oh why would you do that what what don't no don't do that there's a there's a better there's a better way here but you know we think we know best and we make these plans and there are seven billion people in this world and at any given moment any one of them can do something that can mess up our plans there are environmental factors that can mess up our plans there are political factors there are cultural societal governmental fa there are so many things that can get in the way of what it is that we're trying to accomplish and if we are not nimble and able to you know to adjust on a dime and go mm, let's try this then we shouldn't be surprised when things don't turn out exactly like we hope they will. So we have to be able to be flexible, which I, I'm sure it has some to do with why you named the company Nimble. Well, Joel, I think that what you're saying is that you have to be, if you're hustling and grinding, you're not gonna be present and aware. And if you're not present and aware, you won't hear the universe knocking. And if you don't hear the universe knocking and walk through the doors that it presents you throughout your life, 
then you won't achieve your passion, plan, and purpose in life. And I think the universe does two things. It, it listens to your prayers and it presents you doors for you to walk through. And if you don't listen to those knocks, then the universe smacks you to wake you up. Mm. And, uh, and then you really have to listen because you've been smacked. And I feel like uh, you're my translator. Like, Joel, what, what, what you're really saying, Joel, it's great. It's like we're speaking the same language, but you have a different way of saying it, which I'm nodding my head. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm, I, I agree. And I, and and I love and the metaphor of the doors, John, because people, okay, you know, we're told if there's a door you want to get to the other side and that door is closed and locked and bolted, you are supposed to bang away at that door you just keep knocking and you keep working on getting that door to open that's never been my experience my experience is to go why the heck would i spend all of my energy and put all of my eggs in that one door right there because oh look around take the blinders off did you happen to notice that over there there's a door that's open a little bit there's a door that's wide open there's a window you can peek into there is opportunity opportunity literally everywhere but some people get so tunneled vision and this is what i need to do and this is how i'm going to do it and i'm going to keep persisting that they miss all of those open doors and windows and that is how i can say i have fallen into so much opportunity in my life just because i was aware and i found something interesting and because it connected with me personally i decided to play uh, there have been more than enough doors or windows open that are opportunity just to make money and more often than not i've walked away from those doors because what was behind them wasn't connected to a passion of mine it wasn't interesting enough i would have had to sell a piece of my soul and sacrifice a piece of my life to go do something just for a buck. I would rather connect with those things that connect with my heart, with my passions, with my mind, with my desires. And I discover that when I do that, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to unpack a little bit about what you just said. One of Let's which unpack. is, um, uh, Life isn't about money. I think it's mm. about memories mm. and uh, moments and memories. And uh, have you ever been into a graveyard before? Oh, Joel? of course. So I never, the... never underground though. Yeah, I, I don't yet. think I have been. I, but I don't know if I haven't lived other lives, right? Like other. <laughs> sort of, I think I think that our star stuff, our souls, are are transcendent, right? They they move beyond the the shell that we live in. But I'm not going to get into that philosophy with you right now. So when I walk through a graveyard, I've never seen a gravestone that said made a million dollars, built a, a gold mine, um, uh, conquered uh, 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 Europe, right? You see beloved father, friend, husband, brother, sister, mother, that's what you see, right? And I think that's a reflection of why we're here. And so it's not about money, honey, it's about moments and memories. And then the other thing that you said is you dance through life like a Grateful Dead concert and, and, you, and, you, and you almost live multiple lives. And I almost think that's like the Forrest Gump philosophy of life, right? That you, you basically, you see these opportunities that, that sing to your passion, plan and purpose in life. And then you move into that door and you do that thing for the moments and the times that it feels right. And then you then sort of dance onto that other thing, almost like that rock hopping ph philosophy and there's a creek near my home in malibu creek state park that i used to go hop on these hogweed like things they were basically these these this plant they, they, that grows in this river and it's like a like a like a little like like round thing and i would jump between these hogweeds in this river when i was like 16 with my hair halfway down my back and with my friends just just free and and I'm going to tell you, we were naked and just running through the forest. And I think, you know, you have to do that in life is just is just let yourself go, which gets us to the passion, plan and purpose of your life. Hmm. Do, do, do you believe in the three P's that you, you should have some sort of uh, figure out what your passion is, even if it's for this moment in time and build a plan to achieve it and make it your purpose? 
uh, on a regular, on a daily basis so that you can stay focused? Or do you just throw it all to the wind? I, I don't disagree in any of these, but I'm going to throw a fourth P in there, and that's personality, yeah. right? Yeah. Because <laughs> your, your passion, your plan, and your purpose are going to vary based on your personality. There is no one size fits all, which is why the fun formula is not a mathematical formula. You have to bring your personality into the equation, and that's where your passion is going to come from. And from that personality, you're going to come up with your plan. You're going to discover your own individual purpose, but they're all incredibly important. You know, without a purpose, without vision we we perish and it without the passions what why do we want to do anything you know how are we designed to bring value to the world and we have to just discover those and, you know so in, in discovering your passion there's a lot of times we're blind even to our own passions i remember when i was in college at university of illinois one a, a family member said to me knowing my love for music and how, how i was always playing records uh, she said, why don't you try out for the radio station there? And I thought, you know, I never saw myself as a DJ, but I've always, I grew up listening to Chicago, you know, rock radio and thinking, wow, that could be really cool. And it unlocked a passion that I didn't even know was there. And for the next several years of my life, I was a radio DJ and then a nightclub DJ. And my first entrepreneurial venture was having my own mobile DJ business. And all of that came from somebody igniting a passion that was already there. And, and so the tip here is if you're not exactly sure what you're good at or what your next step is, ask somebody that you trust, that you love, that knows you and just really open-ended. You know, if I was going to do anything, what do you think I would be good at? And then be open and you'll know if it's the right thing. When that family member said, why don't you try out to be a DJ? It's like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. And you start, I, starting to see a pattern here? I do. And, and, and I really believe that if you trust in the universe, that it will communicate with you and help you to find these things. And in regards to your passion, I think that you inherently feel when something is right. Like when you're driving a car and the wheels are wobbling, you can feel it doesn't really drive right. And I think in life, you feel when the, when the things are wobbling, but when, it, when it's humming and you're just digging it and you can't wait to get up and you go to sleep thinking about whatever it is that you're doing, then you know you're on the right track. But what I love, love, love about what you just said was the fourth P, personality. Because mm -hmm. I believe that people connect in the five values of life, family, friend, food, fun, and fellowship. And you expose those to others by opening up your heart and rolling up your sleeves and showing others your heart and your soul, which helps people to understand who you are and find commonalities to connect. And that deepens a relationship which enables them to see you, which they can then reflect back to you, the good and the bad, to help you stay aligned to your four P's of life. And that requires something that scares a lot of people. And that requirement is authenticity, vulnerability, mm -hmm. transparency. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it is being unafraid or being afraid, but still seeking to be as real uh, as human as we actually are. You know, I posted a picture on uh, Instagram yesterday because I was walking through the streets of Denver and I came upon uh, next to a, a trash can, there was this full length mirror. It was laying on its side and it was clearly completely shattered. It was just broken, but all the pieces were on the mirror still. And I walked by it and then I said, no, that is a moment. You need to turn around. I turned around. I came to the mirror. I got down to the level and I took a, a picture of myself in this broken mirror. And mm -hmm. my post on Instagram was about how we need to recognize that we are so very human, that we are we've all experienced things in our lives that leave us broken. Um, mm -hmm. And when you combine the, that brokenness, those scars that we have with our inherent flaws, because none of us mm -hmm. are perfect, it creates an opportunity to relate to others in our business, in our life, in a way that will truly encourage others. But people are afraid 
to show who they really are, to be completely real, to admit that they have struggles, to be able to point out the flaws that they have without feeling shame. Uh, and, and I've discovered that some of the most successful and satisfied people are those that have become comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. You know, Joel, b believe it or not, I, um, I uh, have been uh, shy and insecure in many times in my life and uh, struggled to believe in the things that I was trying to do. And it was only through a simple philosophy of life that I've achieved anything that I've ever done. And that is to believe and keep putting one foot in front of the other mm. and to trust in the universe. And I think that sometimes the, the biggest failures that we have are the best teachers and that we need to deconstruct ourselves to reconstruct ourselves. And when you talk about that broken mirror and you take a picture of yourself in there, sometimes you need to break yourself to remake yourself, which kind of leads me to the idea of what is reverse engineering your successes? Hmm. Well, it's kind of looking at them saying, how did I get here? How did I become a New York Times bestselling author? How did I get, how have I done 15 books? How did I have a number one iPhone app? How did I sell a site to Yahoo, right? How did I do a, a create an information product that sold a million dollars in five days? How did I get there? What were the actions I took? And that's where I uncovered that it was a lot more natural um, than the hustle and grind would lead you to believe. And, you know, you said that you have to sometimes break yourself. Well, that might be true, but I kind of feel like life will do it <laughs> for yeah. you. Uh, I'm, not, fact, I'm not saying you break yourself, but sometimes you have to go down a road that's a dead end or something that is uncomfortable for you to find your real way. I, I, I want to aside right here because Chris just wrote, I'm in a business book club and this is going to be the book I recommend for our next read. Glad I made time for the session. You guys are having a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. That uh, That's that's why we're here. Uh, that is specifically why we're here. I, I want to tell you about a time. I'm, I'm going to um, lead by example here because I talk about getting vulnerable, right? And keeping it real. So with your permission, I'm going to uh, get extremely real right now. Um, back in 2010, my wife left me and uh, I had two kids. Um, it, be, it was the most broken experience of my life in terms of what it did you know, to me inside. And I actually gave a, a TED talk about this a few years ago here in Denver. And, and I take you know, full responsibility for my part of you know, the failure of my marriage and then some. And, uh, and, I, and I honor my ex in that. Um, and you know, there's no ill will there, but I took some time. I took like a mini sabbatical, if you will, to deal with my brokenness and my shatteredness, uh, which meant taking care of myself physically, uh, where I lost about 55 pounds because I was unhealthy, uh, where I took care of myself emotionally by becoming vulnerable and speaking with a counselor and getting re with my friends and found a lot of healing there. And spiritually, I found, you know, I sought God and I found God in a way that was meaningful and significant to me. Well, while I was still on this sabbatical, I wasn't writing books. I wasn't really speaking. I wasn't completely off the grid, but I really backed off of a lot. I was getting restless and I wasn't ready to go back to work as I knew it, um, to put myself out there. But I wanted to do something and I wanted to shake up my paradigm a little bit. So I thought, I'm going to go get a job, not out of necessity, but I wanted to put myself in a situation that gave me a new perspective, a paradigm shift. Uh, and, and I think you know how this ended up, John, but I didn't go to, I wanted to work retail because I thought this way I'll work with people, right? I'll, I'll deal with customer service face to face. I knew I didn't want to do clothing or apparel. Um, I'd make a horrible shoe salesman. I, I thought I dabbled with the idea of like going to Best Buy, but I didn't want to become a blue shirt that always annoyed people with, are you finding everything okay? Um, and I ended up the only place that an author should end up. <laughs> and that was a Barnes and Noble. And I worked mm. as a cashier, one or two shifts a week, 
checking out people. It was so funny because when I walked in and looked, you know, filled out the application, the manager came out and was like, what are you doing here? Uh, we have your books on the shelf. Why do we want to do this? And I explained to him what I wanted to do. And I got to tell you, taking that risk and working for somebody in a position, in an industry that I was familiar with, but on the other side of it was so enlightening and so valuable to me because when people would come to the counter, I talked to them. You know, most of the times you go check out and people are like beep, beep, and they, you know, you swipe your card and you're gone. But I would notice the books they were bringing up and I was, oh, it's a photography book. Are you a photographer? Oh no, it's for my, my son. Oh, this is Antar. Are you going to Antarctica? Yeah, I've got this trip. And I would talk to people and just by talking to people, John, here's the sales connection. Barnes and Noble had this plan um, that, you know, you buy the membership like $25 and you get discounts, 10% off. And just by talking to people and offering them this, the, the Barnes and Noble membership, I sold more memberships than anybody else in that store just by having discussions and showing that I cared. Mm. Yes. I, I love <clears throat> the analogy of you trying new things and dancing through life and what you learn by getting in the trench with customers who are going through the journey of buying books and you not only probably learned how to write better books because you learned how people discovered and, and acquired those books but you also kind of rediscovered your soul because i believe that by being truly present and connected with other human beings it softens your heart and it grows your soul mm -hmm. and um and 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 i think that um the other thing that I hear in this is the thing that Ben just talked about is Ben carries. He, he worked with you in, in, uh, in yeah, uh, I see that. we, we had a pretty significant staff there wow. and hi Ben glad that you're, uh, that you're listening. And, and, and this reminds me of the journey of what it took to build gold mine. I'm going to share it with you real quick. Cause I think it applies directly to the fun formula. So I bought my first computer in 1978 and I, when I was in uh, just graduated high school and I went to community college to start my college career because I didn't do what it took to get a into a university in high school. I was a Birkenstock wearing long hair, Grateful Dead attending concert goer. So you can just imagine who I was. And so I, uh, I worked my way through uh, peers for uh, years working at a computer land store because I love computers in the process of of work in the com computer store, I learned about uh, microcomputers and microcomputer software and how businesses buy computers and how businesses sell computers. And, um, and then uh, I didn't want to be a salesman because my dad was had a car business all my life and I basically kind of thought sales was the four letter word. And I wanted to be more like my uncle who helped invent radar and microwave at MIT. So I finished my computer science degree and I got a job at Hughes Space and Communications. And I worked for two years at Hughes Space and Communications and Hughes uh, Missile Systems. And in the process there, I learned how big corporations buy computers and then implement microcomputer software to achieve business goals. And they couldn't get the AMRAM to hit a jet from 50 miles away, air to air missile. And I built an uh, executive information system that tied together disparate data on minis and mainframes across manufacturing, design, and test plant sites across the United States and built this tool that enabled people to get a glimpse that gave them a view of how they could basically make the thing work. Mm -hmm. And and then I went and got a job. I, I didn't want to be in aerospace after a couple of years. I, I got a job at a startup in Boston. I learned how people manufactured and sold software through resellers and to large enterprise customers. And if I didn't go through all those experiences, I wouldn't have been able to not only synthesize Goldmine, but also be able to, um, to scale it because it was the sum of the parts that enabled me to do the thing. And right now, whoever's listening to this, you're in a journey in your life. You're learning things. You've learned things. And what the form form formula says to me is that the universe knocked on my door when I was struggling as a sales rep in Dallas, Texas, selling enterprise network operating systems to Mark Cuban as a reseller in, in Dallas. And I heard that knock. And I opened the door and I jumped out of that airplane without a parachute and I landed and retired 10 years later. And if you'd listen to anything in this formula, I think it's 
that the journey is going to present you with opportunities and each journey, whether imperfect, perfect or imperfect it is, is that learning experience that sums it up into your life success. If you're present and aware, listen and go through the door. Mm, I like that. You know, a lot of people try to put the cart before the horse. They, they want to get there faster and there really aren't shortcuts. I think everything happens and unfolds it, you know, at the right time. Uh, so many times people want to get there faster, but they're not ready to get there. And sometimes you have to wait for that right person to come your way. There's a number of projects I have, you know, I've got that you've seen my do good stuff brand. It's a, you know, I came up with the idea of do good stuff. I registered the hashtag do good stuff. I've got t-shirts and trademarks and I've owned it for several years. And I know that at some point, if it's going to be wildly successful and get picked up by a retailer, somebody's going to come into my path that loves it and that has the connections and wants to make it happen. I'm not gonna force it. I'm not out there trying to shop it. It's one of those things that I believe in, but I have so many things that I believe in that I enjoy doing. I think that if, if it's meant to be at the right time, it will happen. And at the same time, I'm coming at it with open hands. You know, everybody clench your fists for a second, like you're holding on to something. When you're holding on to something so tightly, there's no room for anything else. But when you come at life with open hands uh, and let go of certain things that don't have to happen that way, you'll find out that you can accept and receive other things that you hadn't thought of. And, and I think that's the openness that you're talking about. That's the, the opportunity that is all around us. I want to share one more thing that happened while I was writing this book, John as long as I'm being transparent. Um, after I came off my sabbatical, I started writing books again. I started speaking again, but I wasn't really, I didn't really have direction and there wasn't a very specific passion. Um, I got known in the social media circles and speaking at social media events and all that. And that's all well and good, but there wasn't really a fire. And here I am writing the manuscript for the fun formula. And I'm asking myself this question. What if at the age of 53, my greatest work is behind me? I'm doubting myself as I'm writing the book. I'm asking myself, what if the things that I have done are as good as it's going to get and I'm going to coast on this? Well, that is incredibly frustrating to me because I want to believe that I'm stacking, you know, like you say, it's building block upon block and that it's going to lead to something else. But as I'm writing the book, I'm telling people they have to tr trust the process and I find myself having to trust that very same process, believing that I don't know what the next thing is that I'm going to do, but something is going to happen and I'm going to be receptive and I'm going to see it when it happens. Fast forward to the time in between the first draft of the book and the second draft coming back to me from the editor. I start going down this cryptocurrency rabbit hole. This would be in April of 2017. I had heard about Bitcoin. I know some friends that had gotten into it. And for whatever reason, I didn't get it. And usually I'm on the front lines of stuff. And I suppose you could say still I'm kind of on the front lines, but I missed it for a few years. And I started going down the rabbit hole and I was fascinated with what I was discovering about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and blockchain technology and the future of digital money, so much so that I began having conversations with our, our mutual friend, Travis Wright, who's a leading marketing technologist. And Travis and I turned out we were going down this rabbit hole at the same time. And almost every day on Messenger, we're asking, you know, what do you think of the price of this? And what do you think about this technology? And one day in July, it was actually July 16th, 2017, he sent me a message and it was, fr uh, it was framed sarcastically, but because we were talking so much about the topic, Travis said, when are we going to start the Joel and Travis crypto show? John, uh, you, you could have hit me with a ton of bricks at that moment. 
I thought, oh my gosh, I'm calling you now, Travis. I called him and I said, we have to do this. We have to do this podcast. We don't know what we're talking about, but we don't understand these other podcasts that are over our heads. What if we did a show that was just two dudes talking crypto, going down the rabbit hole and bringing people along on the journey with us? And we'll call it the bad crypto podcast because we don't know what we're talking about, but we're fascinated. He said, let's do it. Two days later, the first episode of the show was launched just using the skills that he and I had to produce, you know, record, uh, edit and, and put out an episode. Fast forward to a year later, and we've had over 5 million downloads in our first year. We've recorded over 200 shows. We're being asked to go and speak at events and do our show live or provide other services. And it, it has totally shaken my world and my direction. And it happened while I was having to do the very thing that I'm telling people they need to do to be curious, to take a risk, and to trust the process. Yes, and be present and willing enough to open those doors when when the phone rings, right? And, and uh, numbers not and coming. I, Couldn't have imagined. Yeah. If you would have told me, you know, uh, just a month before I started learning about crypto that you're gonna have one of the top cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain shows in the world, I would say, what? Oh, he, he, that's crazy talk right there. I remember when you guys first started, I remember not too long ago, the year anniversary. And it's just amazing to watch that journey of how you guys have hopped from rock to rock in the river as the river unfolds, finding new opportunities. Uh, but it's, it's really be only because partially of your sharing your passion with another human being and building that relationship by sharing your personality with the other person. And there's a couple of analogies that were going through my head about life and trust and letting go. Joel, have you ever ridden a motorcycle? Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of of, of motorcycles. I had, I think okay. uh, I got afraid when I saw a friend uh, lose a leg in college um, through no fault of his own. A car hit him. And I'm like, you yeah. know what? I think I feel much safer, <laughs> you know, no. with, uh, with the car surrounding me. So I've never ridden a street bike, but I used to ride dirt bikes at in, in Indian Dunes out in, um, out in, uh, I don't know, I, I guess it's out near Saugus someplace. And um, there is a mountain section and a desert section. And when you ride a motorcycle through the desert, you can't hold on to the steering wheels because mm. it will crash because the desert forces your wheel to flow and it's moving. And if you try to control the wheel too much, you, you'll fall literally. And you have to let go a mm. little bit of the steering wheels of the, of the handlebars and let the handlebars float in your hands to a certain extent. And I love how that sort of applies to this idea about life that if you're so busy, holding on to that your handlebars of life and trying to control the direction in the hustle and grind that you you're going to crash or you're going to miss out on opportunities which gets me to this other story about how i met my wife now i don't know if you've ever been looking for a relationship but there's been times in my life where i just i just wanted to be with to someone you know and you ever been there in life of oh. course certainly yeah because I can, I, I think, I think that people love to be seen, heard, loved, and wanted, right? And I think if you understand that desire in other human beings, that you could really use it to build connections at scale that are marvelous. But I just moved to Hermosa Beach, and I didn't really know anybody. And I went out to a club by myself, hoping to connect, right? And and I just wasn't feeling it. Didn't really want to be there. I'm not really a club guy by myself anyway. So. I, I went to get a guacamole burger, a California burger from Coco's because I'm a burger guy and uh, and it was like 12 o'clock and I'm sitting there and serendipity happens. I look across, I see this woman. She's beautiful. Her eyes just captivated me. The only problem was is she was with this other girl and then she was surrounded by six guys from New York, three on each side and they were kind of, you know, working it. And I'm the kind of guy that believes 
easier than a parking lot. When I pull into a, a, a parking lot, that I, there's a spot right by the front door. And I always drive assuming that that spot's going to be there for me. And it usually is, Joel. And so in, in, in this situation, I went and sat between the two girls. It was like one of those booths where the tables open in between the split of the booths. And I sat between them and I just started to engage. And we had an hour or two hour conversation. And, uh, and I invited her to, um, to, to cook her dinner the next night. And I cooked her dinner the next night. We went out dancing and, and the rest is history, man. I've been married now for, I don't know, 26 years. And you know, Joel, it hasn't been perfect. It, it, life isn't perfect. But if you don't try to over control it, if you believe and you let go a little bit, life unfolds and it's fucking beautiful. Totally agree. And people have to step away from their fear. Uh, you know, I, you really, you do talk a lot about faith in the, the words that you're saying. And, you know, uh, whether people, uh, you know, go to the Bible or not, there's a story uh, um, that happened in the, the New Testament where uh, Jesus was out on the water, walking on the water, right? And the disciples were in this boat and they thought they were seeing a ghost out there on the water. And Peter, uh, one of the disciples, said, I, I want, you know, if that's you, Jesus, I want to walk out to you on the water. If you can do it, I can do it. And uh, there was a storm everywhere. And, and you know, who walks on water, right? We don't walk on water. But Peter got out of the boat. Uh, he took his eyes off the prize. He started sinking. But when he put his eyes back where they belonged, he walked on the water. Okay, whether it's real or not isn't the point. What the point is, is that if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. You have to take that risk. Mm. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. You will be exactly where you are now, except life will do other things that might toss you about. You got to carpe diem you got to get out of the boat if you want to walk on the water amen brother amen i love that and with that i'd love to uh open it up for any questions uh, that the audience may have uh, and while we're waiting for those questions uh john dubach uh, uh just said uh thanks for the enlightening webinar it's true you need balance i ski for with two 80 year olds that do 100 wow. half days at snowbird every year and they say, John, the mountain will be here long after we're gone. Mm. And then he says, John Ferrar launched me into a thousand companies with his energy in 1991. Glad to see he's found the balance. Uh, thanks, John Dubach. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to continue to do what I do, Joel, without people like John around me. Because I, 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 I was walking out of my doctor's office uh, a while back. My ENT who happened to save my life when I had my tumor. <sighs> And I bumped into this little old man. I looked down and I said, shit, you're Mick Jagger. You're old and you're <laughs> tiny. Now, I didn't say that, right? But but I thought it, right? Because Mick Jagger is old and wrinkled and tiny. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, why does this guy get up on stage a hundred times a year when he's so old and he's probably got more money than, you know, God. And, and I realized the answer to that. And it's the same reason why basically came out of retirement and built nimble is because I believe that we're here to grow by helping other people grow. And the, and the, and the feedback that we get from that dance, when people stop you and say, you changed my life, that's the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Joel? I, I, I agree. It's like, if we feel like we have purpose and we are using our God given talents and, and passions and abilities to impact others in the world when you discover that that mission has been accomplished it's so satisfying uh it, and you also come to realize most people never tell you how you've impacted their life um you know you're more likely to hear a complaint you know somebody's unhappy with something you've done than to get a thank you so for you know each one that says thank you realize that there are so many others that have never returned to to let you know how you've impacted their life and just rest in that and know if you are or doing good stuff, if you are following your passion, if you are seeking to bring value to others in the world through your passions, your talents, your skills, your abilities, your personality, you are having an impact whether you know it or not. Amen. Well, with that, it looks like it's a wrap. I don't see any specific questions. We're going to wrap? 
I'm with John uh, Herrera. We're here today. We're talking about fun formula. It'll show you the way. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of show you the way, yeah. I saw uh, Peter Frampton in 1977 with uh, Yes in Black Oak, Arkansas at the Anaheim, Convent uh, Anaheim Baseball Stadium. And uh, when he played, you know, show me the way I'll do like I do. Yeah, uh, that's great. Um, oh, so we could talk, so, you and I could talk music for hours. Like it'd be so fun to go through each other's music library. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here in my my wooden uh, office, looking at my album uh, collection, and um, alongside my albums are my books. And I believe that. When you go into somebody's office, you should look at the walls, look at the books they read, look at the school they went to, the knickknacks they collect. And in my office, I have, you know, books by um, Padahasma Yogananda. I have, uh, I have the New American Standard uh, Bible. I have books on uh, the Aztecs and uh, Zion and astronomy and photography. And, and, you know, you really get to know somebody by, by looking at that. And that's, how you connect with others is across those commonalities. But bringing us back to the uh, close, sign up for um, uh, a 14 day trial at uh, the following URL and, uh, and you get a chance to win autographed copies of Joel's book. Um, and, uh, and besides that, just reach out to Joel and I, we wanna, we wanna connect with you. We want to know more about you. We want to know how we might be able to blow some wind in your sales because in the end, I truly believe that is why we are here. Mm -hmm. Joel, take us away. Close us out. I, I don't disagree. Uh, you know, if you guys go grab a copy of the book, funformulabook.com is the website. There's a bunch of bonuses there when you get it. Uh, sign up for this 14-day free trial. You might win an autographed copy that I'll be happy to personalize and, and send to you. John, thanks so much for uh, giving me the privilege to come and speak to your audience today. It's been great fun. Love talking with you. And uh, when you're in Denver, you make sure that you stop on by. I will, buddy. Talk to you soon. And, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Go make it uh, an amazing uh, day. Adios, amigos and amigas.